Hello, this is Rachel Bevan from Oncology News Australia, proud producers of the Oncology Journal Club. Today's special episode is dedicated to the recent ASCO GI meeting. We've analysis from a range of experts, including Jeannie Tai, Nick Pavlakis, Jeremy Shapiro, Matthew Burge, Chris Karapetis, Tim Price, and of course, our hosts, Eva Segaloff, Craig Underhill, and Hans Prenham. Hans presented at ASCO GI, so he chats us through his paper in the Quick Bites section too. We've added timestamp chapters so you can easily navigate to each segment and speaker. Thanks to everyone who participated, and thanks to all our listeners. We hope you enjoy today's entertaining and informative episode. As ever, links to all of the papers discussed today are available in the notes. For the latest oncology news and podcast updates, subscribe to the Oncology Newsletter for free on oncologynews.com.au. This is Rachel Babin, and this is the Oncology Podcast. So ASCO GI usually happens in San Francisco in January. It's a buzzing town if you step over the homeless people, but that's another issue. We love getting together at ASCO GI. This year it was virtual and I think affected by the pandemic. Lots of updates of trials, not a huge amount of new data, but nevertheless some really important studies. There was a wonderful study presented from Belgium. I'll ask my colleague, Professor Prennan, if he knows about that one. Actually, I do because they even invited me to present it. So I was quite happy. But please listen to this full podcast if you want to know the details about the study. It's about CAR T's. So I would advise you to keep on listening. We have a lot of people today that we would like to interview about different topics, Eva. Yes, we have the AGITG Polywog group. And you'll have to listen to the end of the podcast to find out what that is. But we have some fantastic people, each giving commentary on the different trials that are from ASCO GI. And we invite you to sit back and listen. This is a composite of the snippets of interviews. We've also got the longer, more detailed analysis of each study on our link Click on the link, please. And now to our first study. It's a great pleasure to welcome to the this special edition of the podcast, Jeannie Tai, who is a medical oncologist and specialist in colorectal cancer from Peter McCallum Cancer Institute in Melbourne and also Western Health in Melbourne. She's a senior research fellow at the WEHI, the lead investigator on the dynamic ctDNA adjuvant trials. So she's an international expert in the field of ctDNA. And we've asked her to come on to this special edition to talk about abstract number 11, which was entitled Circulating Tumor DNA Analysis for Assessment of Recurrence Risk, Benefit of Adjuvant Therapy, and Early Relapse Detection after treatment in colorectal cancer patients. So Jeannie, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for coming on. No, thanks, Craig. Thanks for having me. So do you want to just outline this abstract for us? Yes, yeah, sure. Really, I think as as everyone knows, our approach to patient selection for adjuvant chemotherapy based on pathology currently is is imprecise with over-treatment and under-treatment of patients. And there's now growing evidence that blood tests taken after surgery looking for circulating tumor DNA can detect microscopic disease, a term known as minimal residual disease, and this may help guide adjuvant treatment. So this abstract presented by Dr. Henriksen and the colleagues recruited 265 stage 1 to 3 colorectal cancer patients from Denmark and Spain and analyzed the serial blood samples for ctDNA with the Signaterra tumor-informed personalized assay where individual patients' tumor is first sequenced to look for mutations and a ctDNA assay and then is then customized for that patient based on their tumor mutation profile. So it is a prospective observational study. Uh, it's not a randomized study as such. But I think the key findings are that tumor DNA were detected in the circulation in about 9% of patients after surgery 
And importantly of these, 75% have relaxed. Now, this is in contrast to only 13.6% of patients with negative CTGN who experience subsequent relapse. What is, I think, intriguing is that in the five patients or 25% of patients who have initial positive CTDNA who did not recur or had received adjuvant chemotherapy, suggesting that standard adjuvant chemotherapy can still cure a proportion of these CTDNA positive patients. The authors also looked at serial CTDNA during surveillance in over 200 patients. And what they found was that in patients who had a negative CTDNA during their surveillance, have a very low recurrence risk of 3%. But any patient who have a positive test after finishing their de- definitive treatment during surveillance has um, predicted for almost 100% of relapse. Really speak to how robust this test is. And they also compared to CEA and demonstrated that CTDNA outperforms CEA in predicting recurrence. The other thing to note in this abstract is that they found it's a lead time of eight months between CTDNA detection and radiological detection or clinical dis- detection. Perhaps the caveat may be a bit misleading, the, the lead time, given that CTDNA was collected three monthly, whereas the CT scan was done at 12 and 13 months, meaning that the scan is not done at the same time as CTDNA collection, which may create some bias in terms of the lead time. But how useful this lead time may be in the future is really a subject of a question for a randomized trial. So tell us again about, you said the particularly intriguing part was the study also showed that effective therapy can be curative in a portion of the MRAD positive patients. We know that CTDNA positive patients uh, is a poor prognostic indicator if they are not treated with further treatment. What we don't know until now is that how many, how, what is the proportion of patient with CTDNA positive disease can be cured with just standard chemotherapy. So this study didn't, didn't really answer the question, how, what's the proportion of patient uh, with positive CDDNA who subsequently had adjuvant chemotherapy are cured. But based on the Australian data, our previous stage two and also some stage three data, we believe up to about 50% of patients with positive CDDNA can be cured just with conventional chemotherapy. I think the trick then is to do a CTDNA analysis when they finish their standard adjuvant chemotherapy and those who remain positive, there may be an opportunity to add on what we call a second line adjuvant chemotherapy concept, especially if they don't have imaging detected recurrence at that time point to see whether we can cure more patients. Yes, it's a really fascinating field. So how close do you think this is getting to day-to-day practice like are these tests expensive to do and how close is the evidence base to convincing you to use it routinely? Cost is a good question. I think the most sensitive assay to date for MRD or microscopic disease detection are the tumor informed assay and they they are quite costly. They're about uh, say four to five thousand dollars a test because you have to sequence the tumor first and then the assay. Although there are really now undeniable prognostic implications for CTDNA detection after surgery, but the utility in how we can use CTDNA to guide treatment and whether that could improve outcome remains to be proven in randomized trial setting. In my last count, there are now nine adjuvant clinical trials internationally, including three trials in Australia, looking at the strategy of de-escalating treatment in negative patient, escalating treatment in positive patient, I think until the reader of this study, I don't think that CTDNA should be used routinely to guide treatment. I think uh, adopting these tests early can be dangerous. Dynamic stage two study will have its first readout end of this year. So so that's very exciting. Hopefully it'll be the the first trial to demonstrate some utility for CTDNA. So yeah, very excited. And you wanted to mention, you picked up in the meeting, there was another important abstract 102. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about that, Jeannie? 
APTRA 102 is a very similar study, but done in the UK. It's called the UK TRAC study once again. What they reported is another prospect observational study where they uh, reported just over 100 patients with stage 2 and 3 colon cancer and similarly taken blood after surgery and tracked them for recurrence using a different assay, also a tumor informed assay, but not in a Natera, Signatera assay used in the Danish study and essentially reproduce the same result. I think it's been reproduced over and over again now in multiple different cohorts of patients we wish using different different assay that this is a extremely good marker in predicting recurrence. Yeah, so I think they showed that patients with a detectable ctDNA following surgery had a 42% relapse rate with a median follow-up of 15.5 months. And in contrast, the patients with an undetectable CTDNA, only 8% of them relapse versus the 42%. Mm -hmm. So that's quite a stark difference, isn't it? It is. It is. Yeah. So it's a fascinating field. Thank you so much for your time, for coming on the show. We look forward to contributing more patients to your studies. I think obviously the studies are now so pivotal in proving the utility or not of these uh, tests. And I think to watch this space, isn't it, in the, over the next decade, we may well see that we're using these tests routinely to direct intensification or not of treatment for colon cancer patients. It's great. Yeah, I think it's truly changing the paradigm. So it's a great pleasure to welcome good friend onto the podcast for this special post-ASCO GI session. That's Professor Nick Pavlakis from Sydney. Nick is a medical oncologist at Royal North Shore and he has a particular interest in GI and lung cancer. Welcome, Nick. Thanks, Craig, and it's a real privilege to be a part of this uh, group. And um, I was just thinking, it was exactly one year ago, my last conference was ASCO GI 2020. <laughs> wow. Uh, Any coincidence. I hope you took advantage of it and had a great time. I did, actually. I did some wine tasting at the Napa. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All right, Nick, so we're going to focus on pancreas cancer now, and you're going to review an abstract for us entitled Alliance A021501 Preoperative Modified Fulfurinox or Modified Fulfurinox Plus Hypofractionated Radiation Therapy for Borderline Resectable adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. Nick, can you just outline them, this study and the main findings for me? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Craig. So this was a randomized phase two study by a, a North American consortium of high-volume pancreas centers whose main purpose in undertaking the study was to try to work out what would be the optimal neoadjuvant regime to take forward in future studies. And they built this study on the back of a single arm phase two study where their experimental arm was to give modified fulfirinox for four cycles plus long course uh, external beam radiotherapy and capecitabine, then surgery, then adjuvant chemotherapy. And they demonstrated that was feasible some years ago. And then with the evolution of the evidence over the years with the demonstration that fulfirinox in the adjuvant setting at least, was an effective regimen, they undertook to test fulfirinox, modified fulfirinox preoperatively. So they had two arms of the study, modified fulfirinox alone and then modified fulfirinox sandwiched with stereotactic radiotherapy or hypofractionated radiotherapy, and they used one or the other, I'm not clear, presumably that was by centre. And then patients went to surgery and they were supposed to finish with another four cycles of Folfox thereafter. Now, it was a pick-the-winner design. And for those uh, listening who aren't familiar with that, what that means is the statistical plan of the study was based on seeing an outcome within each individual arm. It wasn't a comparative design. And what they prefaced it on was an overall survival at 18 months of 50% being the reference and therefore they thought 63% would be worthy of further study. And they had an interim analysis after the first 30 patients, and if they had less than or equal to 11 not go to an R0 resection, then they would close the study or that arm. And the other thing is it was selecting people who 
had borderline resectable disease. And they de defined this according to North American criteria. And in the protocol, they basically, this was basically anyone whose disease interfaced with superior mesenteric vein or portal vein, or it occluded, but it was able to be reconstructed, or it interfaced, or if the tumor interfaced with a hepatic artery, or if there was interface with a superior mesenteric artery, or the celiac artery, but that was less than 180 degrees. And that was the selection criteria. And of course, those are very complicated, and that's often done at an MDT. Basically, the outcome of the study was as follows. In the interim analysis, the arm with radiotherapy failed to meet their boundary for success beyond futility. So they only had 10 people in the first 30 achieve an R0 resection. So they closed the radiation arm. But as you know, when you're doing an uh, independent analysis, they kept accruing to it. So they ended up with 56 patients in that arm. And then the Fulfirinox arm met that boundary and it kept going to the end. So it achieved a final analysis. So in the end, they had 70 patients in the modified Fulfirinox arm and 56 in the Fulfirinox and radiotherapy arm. And ultimately, around 50% of patients had proceeded to completion pancreatectomy in the Fulfirinox arm and only about 35% in the radiotherapy arm. And interestingly, Craig, it's only a small number of patients completed the whole therapy all the way through, including adjuvant. So about 70% finished the preoperative Fulfirinox, and this was similar in both arms, but only 34% completed the adjuvant Fulfox and only about a quarter in the radiotherapy arm. Were you surprised with the results? I mean, these patients did relatively well? Yeah, look, this is a tough regimen and we are doing this in practice. And I think you and I have shared some patients that have come up for surgical opinion in our centre. What this demonstrates to me, and in one of the slides, you'll see that in terms of the drop-off along the way and the reasons for the drop-off in terms of adverse events. This is a, this is a really complex regimen. Unfortunately, and this is the tragedies of the, the way we're improving the evidence in pancreas cancer, I call it we're using sledgehammer therapies, and therefore it's only yeah. suitable for a small number of patients. And so you enter with the hope that the patient will get through. But what this says is even despite that, you know, the success rate, the survivorship at 18 months in the modified for fear in arm was 66%. So that met their boundary. And it's you might say, Nick, why would they use overall survival for an outcome in a phase two study? And that's a good question. And if you go back to the original gemcitabine versus 5FU study. Hang on. It was a good question. I'm going to say, so, Nick, why did they <laughs> use overall survival in a phase two? That's a good question, Craig. I think because it's cleaner. I think because overall survival we know is the benchmark for success and we we – need to improve survival so much in pancreas cancer that it's clearly an unbiased measurement. And if you see an outcome that improves survival, you say this is worthy of going forward. And it's interesting, Craig, that the very first trial that led to us using gemcitabine in pancreas cancer had an overall survival primary endpoint. And also it was the study of gemcitabine versus 5FU that also looked at symptom control, clinical benefit score going back in the 1990s. I put patients on that study, Nick. Yeah, <laughs> it goes, shows how far back we go, Craig. The radiotherapy arm was disappointing, I must say. You know, and I think we need to see the devils in the detail. We need to see the additional endpoints of the study. Uh, interestingly enough, when you look at PCR rate, pathologic complete response, there's 11% PCR rate in the radiotherapy arm, but no PCR in Fulfirinox arm, even though survival was better. A couple of questions then. So do you know if this group's now taking forward Fulfurinox in a larger phase three study? That's one question. The other question is, you know, what do you think our standard of care should be now in Australia for people who have resectable or borderline resectable pancreas cancer? Should If they're fit enough, should they all be having Fulfurinox? Yeah, I think if you take the totality of evidence, and there was a discussion section specifically addressing the best practice in local advanced or borderline resectable pancreas cancer. And they, they reviewed all the evidence, Craig. So there's a matter analysis that shows radiotherapy does in fact improve endpoints to do with local control and resection. 
uh, zero resection. And that's a proof of concept. There was a, a study presented at ASCO that compared gemcitabine and Braxane to Fulfirinox, and that was a randomized phase two, and the data was fairly comparable. The end result of all that is that, look, if a patient's fit enough, well enough, the consensus is Fulfirinox should be the optimal therapy. In the Australian context, of course, we, you know, gemcitabine and Braxane is funded for metastatic disease, but it would be a reasonable alternative outside of the PBS. And to your first question, what is this group doing? I didn't actually do a search of the what they were doing, but I know the Netherlands group, the group that did what's called the PREO-PANK study, a running study called PREO-PANK-2, and they're comparing neoadjuvant fulfirinox versus neoadjuvant gemcitabine-based chemoradiotherapy and adjuvant gemcitabine, and they nearly accrued their patients so far. So they've obviously started this some time ago. And they've already put uh, Fulfirinox in their design. Yep. So last question then, what about in Australia? What's happening in this space in terms of trials in Australia? That's a good question, Craig. And, of course, in Australia, the AGITG is running the master plan study, which is in this population but also broader than that. It's also looking at locally advanced cases, and it's evaluating the addition of SBRT, and it's allowing dealer's choice Preferred for Firinox, modified for Firinox, but you can do gem abraxane. The endpoint in that study is 12 month loco regional recurrence. So the focus of that, our study in Australia is local control. So it's probably designed better to see a positive outcome, whereas this study looked at survival. Outside of a trial, I think what it says, Craig, is we don't know the optimal pathway for the individual patient, and that's the purpose of an MDT. I think most of us will give neoadjuvant chemo, probably for Firinox, and then we'll reassess. And what I didn't mention to you is this study used reassessment points along the way. And I presume each time a patient goes to reassessment, they go back to an MDT discussion. So thanks, Nick, for your time. It's great to have you on. And let's hope we have you back in the future commenting on some more papers from ASCO this year or other meetings down the track. Thank you, Craig. A real pleasure to be a part of it. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Nick. So it's a great pleasure to welcome to the Oncology Journal Club podcast post ASCO GI special, Associate Professor Jeremy Shapiro from Cabrini Hospital in Melbourne, who is a medical oncologist with an interest in particular in gastrointestinal cancers. Jeremy, it's fantastic to have you on the show. Thanks for giving up your time. No worries. Great to be here. And may I say I'm a long-term listener and uh, very excited to be a first-time presenter. Yeah, well, I know you've been following along. It's been a bit of a quick learning curve for all of us, but we're all enjoying it, getting some great feedback. I'm going to introduce now your abstract, which is number 159. It was a little bit controversial when we had a pre-production meeting and chose this, and we'll get to that no doubt, in the discussion. But this is a abstract entitled Confirmed Three-Year Relapse-Free Survival and Overall Survival of the Randomised Trial of Adjuvant S1 versus S1 plus docetaxel after curative resection of stage 3 gastric cancer from a Japanese group. So, Jeremy, do you want to tell us a little bit about S1 and then outline the study and the main findings? Yes, yeah, sure. So uh, we've got an oral 5-FU drug in Australia. It's called Cape Cytobine. And a lot of people have thought, oh, well, they're all the same, these oral drugs. We only need one. There's a few around. But in fact, this one is something quite different. But we don't have it in Australia and we're not likely to get it. So in the very narrow view of this abstract, you might say, oh, these results are not going to be applicable. But as I'm hoping that we'll discuss, I think they are. So what is this one? So firstly, there's the oral fluoropyrimidine component, that's the Tegafer, uh, but then it has a DPD inhibitor attached to it. And one of the problems with oral cape cytobine is that there is a small risk of severe unwanted toxicity if you're DPD deficient. And if you give everyone a, a dose of DPD inhibitor, you level the playing field. And so you reduce that unwelcome small risk of severe toxicity. And then quite cleverly, it adds in a drug that inhibits the intestinal 5-FU phosphorylation. That's called a pterosol and reduces diarrhea. 
And this drug's been around in Japan for a long time, but for reasons that are most unclear, has never been marketed or approved for use in the US or in Australia. But there are a number of adjuvant studies in Japan that have shown benefit, uh, not only in gastric cancer, but also in pancreatic cancer. And the prelude to the trial I'm going to talk about was a trial that the Japanese run between 2001 and 2004, and that was a 1,000 patient study where patients who had D2 gastric cancer resections were randomised just to this tablet or nothing. And the results, uh, which were published actually in JCO about 10 years ago, were remarkable. And the reason they were remarkable is that the cure rate or the five-year survival in the group that did not have any treatment was 61%. And with an uplift of 11% just with this drug, the oral 5-FU pro drug or S1, so 72% five-year survival. And this is just dramatic data when the best we can do perhaps is 40 to 50% five-year survival. So this drug's been approved and routinely used in Japan. And what has happened in this new trial called the JACRO GCGO7 trial is that they have looked to improve upon those results by adding in docetaxel. So it's a randomised trial comparing just the S1, and I should add you have to give it for a whole year, versus S1 and docetaxel. And the docetaxel is low dose by conventional standards. It's only 40 per metre squared. And you only needed to have six doses of this over 18 weeks, but you had to have the S1 for a year. So S1 versus S1 plus docetaxel. And they were planning an 1,100-patient study, and they decided to pick the high-risk patients, so only stage 3 cancers. And they were looking for about a 7 to 8% improvement in the disease-free survival, remembering they already had great results with S1. And if you had asked me, I would have said there's no way they can get this further uplift with just small doses of docetaxel. It's a complete waste of time doing this study. And I would have been wrong because the trial was actually stopped early because it met its efficacy at interim analysis. So the Data Safety Monitoring Committee said, hey, stop the trial. And so only 900 or so patients were recruited. They presented this data at ASCO 2018 and published it in JCO in 2019 as a positive trial with improvement in the primary endpoint of DFS by an increment of about 10% uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.7. And so at this meeting, they just presented their updated data and basically not only does it hold up with longer follow-up, but they presented overall survival for the first time. So remember I told you that even though we're doing comparisons across trials, if you remember that their old trial had a 72% five-year survival, so their standard arm of S1 also got that, it got 71%, but now with this second drug added, they're getting up to 78%, albeit at the three-year survival endpoint. So their conclusion was that in Japanese patients, uh, S1 and docetaxel should be the new standard. The reviewer looked at all the data and said, yep, I agree too. This should be the standard of care. But of course, the rider is in Japanese patients. And what we don't understand is why does this disease behave so differently in Japan? And therefore, it's very hard to extrapolate this data to the Western world. And particularly even more hard when we don't even have this S1 drug to use as a backbone. So kind of interesting data. So do we know what the difference is biologically between Japanese patients and Western patients? Is there something else driving? The short answer is we don't. What we do know is that their surgeons are far more aggressive. So if you think about the last couple of people who've had gastric resections in your practice and look at the number of nodes, my patients normally have maybe 15 or 20 nodes. Uh, But if you look at a patient who's had a a resection in Japan, they usually have 60 or 70 nodes. So this is the uh, the D2 extended resection, which they consider as a standard. And so for a long time, people said, oh, look, it's just the extensive surgery and it's a local regional disease. And if you just get out all the nodes, it doesn't matter if some of them are positive, then uh, of course you'll do better outcomes. So then that was tested with Japanese surgeons going into the West and performing their aggressive surgery in Western patients, particularly in Americans, 
even though they took out heaps of nodes, they could not get the great outcomes. So it's, I think the aggressive surgery is part of it. But I think most of us think it's probably a different biology. But as to what's driving that, we don't know. We also saw it in other parts of Asia. So there, at the same time this S1 data was around, in Korea and Taiwan and China, there was the large classic trial. So that uh, looked at resected gastric cancer. Half the patients didn't get any treatment and half got six months of oxaliplatin-based chemotherapy with Cape Cytobin oxaliplatin. And again, they showed a dramatic benefits, not only with chemo, but also in the group that didn't even get chemo. They had excellent uh, long-term cure rates. And so we're not just seeing it in Japan, we're seeing it throughout Asia. I think it's a different disease as to uh, what the molecular drivers of this are, we don't know, but it does mean that advances in Asian patients don't necessarily translate into the Western society. And so I saw a patient today who had stage three gastric cancer and I've offered them flock chemotherapy because they're young enough and fit enough and I'm hoping to improve their outcome from maybe 30, 35% five-year survival to 50% with perioperative flock and chemo, but nowhere near as we can get in uh, Asian patients. For me, one of the take-homes from this is at least that we should be using combination chemo if we're going to be using adjuvant chemo. We don't see so many patients now such as in this study that didn't get neoadjuvant. But so what just quickly a remaining time, Jeremy, what do you consider as the standard adjuvant treatment now if you did have a patient who has had surgery and presents to you and you discuss adjuvant treatment? Yeah, look, I, I couldn't agree more with you. I think if you and we, we get most of our patients pre op, we discuss them all in the MDM and the general opinion is near adjuvant. Uh, but there are some patients who go straight to surgery and we would generally offer them, since we don't have S1, we would generally offer them uh, oxaliplatin based adjuvant chemotherapy. I guess the two interesting questions for me in this field are one, would immunotherapy add here? So we know from in the last 12 months uh, at ASCO, the very exciting first adjuvant data from nivolumab in patients who had esophageal and also esophageal, gastroesophageal junction cancer, although not true gastric cancers, showing that patients who had a year of nivolumab had a, about a 10% increase in long-term survival, in long-term, or well, at least DFS. We don't know if it's uh, overall survival yet raising the hope that you might be able to cure more patients and will this also prove true in gastric cancer even for the majority of patients who are microsatellite stable so that's one exciting issue and i think the other question is not only should we be moving chemo into the neoadjuvant setting unless you're in asia but what about the role of radiotherapy so you'll know of course that the agitg have virtually completed the top gear trial which Trevor Leung has been running for quite some time now. And this is a remarkable a logistic test of, I think, you know, more than 60 sites in 15 countries and several hundred patients are basically asking the question of does radiotherapy add to chemo when given in the preoperative treatment of resectable gastric cancer? So I'm hoping that advances will come not actually from systemic chemo, but either from preoperative radiotherapy or postoperative immunotherapy. It's a fascinating field, lots of work to do. We all need to stay engaged in clinical trials and get involved. Join up with the trainees, join AGITG if you have an interest in the GI field. So, Jeremy, thanks very much. I'm sure this won't be your first and last time on the podcast. We'll hopefully get you on after some more conference breaking news or other publications. Love to get you back on. Certainly know your stuff, and uh, it was great talking to you. No worries. Pleasure to be here and look forward to more, and particularly Vogel New York, who's been a long-term personal favourite and a great coup to have him so involved in this fantastic session. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Talk to you soon. Continuing on this post-ASCO GI special, it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Matthew Birch, speaking to us from the Royal Brisbane Hospital. Matthew is a medical oncologist with a particular interest in GI cancers. Welcome to the podcast, Matthew. Thank you, Craig. Thank you very much for giving up your time 
to talk about this abstract, which is number abstract 160, which is, well, we're going to stumble over the name of this drug, a randomised double-blind placebo-controlled phase two study of baratituzumab. Bemaratuzumab. 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 Combined with Folfox 6 in first-line treatment of advanced gastroesophageal junction adenocarcinoma, known as the FIGHT study. So, Matthew, could you tell us a little bit about this molecule and outline the study and the main findings? Certainly, yes. So, bemarituzumab is a monoclonal antibody specifically targeted against fibroblast growth factor receptor 2 with a B isoform, as I understand it, so FGFR2B. It's supposed to have antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity is one of its main mechanisms of action. So this was, as you say, Craig, a study looking at the activity of this antibody against FGFR2 overexpressing patients with gastric or gastroesophageal junction adenocarcinoma. So all these patients had to be either overexpressing by immunohistochemistry and or amplified for the FGFR2 gene based on circulating tumour DNA analysis. This was originally meant to be a randomised phase 3 study, but during the course of the study, it was changed to a randomised phase 2. I'm not entirely sure of the reasons for that, but I think it was mainly due to the fact they didn't know what the percentage of the population would be eligible based on the biomarker. And they really had no idea about that. So we're concerned about how long it would take for a phase three to recruit to. So ultimately, they recruited 150 patients to this study. And as you say, it was a placebo-controlled double-blind study to modified Volfox 6 plus placebo or to modified Volfox 6 plus bemarituzumab. It was a global study. Uh, it was presented by Zen Weinberg, who's from Los Angeles. But it was a global study with about half the patients being from Asia and half the patients being European. Either gastric or geojunction patients were eligible. They were all metastatic or recurrent patients who were treated as for in, in the first line. It was a positive study in that the study met all of its endpoints. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival which was improved from a median of 7.4 to 9.5 months with the addition of bemarituzumab. Hazard ratio was 0.68, but there was also an increase in overall survival and response rates. What the authors also found, which cemented their findings in their opinion, was that the higher the expression of FGFR2 by immunohistochemistry, patients had more benefit from the addition of bemarituzumab. On the downside, side effects were noted, and specifically this drug seems to cause mucositis, but also corneal issues such as keratitis, and approximately 25 to 30% of patients had to come off permanently berimaritizumab because of corneal toxicities. These patients all had uh, ophthalmologic assessments every eight weeks during the study. So this is a side effect of this drug, which we don't seem to see with the FGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors, such as pemigatinib, infragatinib, which, as you know, are currently being investigated in cholangiocarcinoma, as amongst other cancers. So this seems to be a specific side effect to this, this particular antibody. And I think these side effects are clearly of concern and are going to be something we're going to have to manage should this drug make it through the next stage, which is going to be a randomised phase three study now that the phase two study was successful. Was there more detail on that? Like how severe were these corneal AEs? Were they? 23% of patients had grade three corneal AEs as per the grading system. I don't quite know what that means, to be honest, but to be called grade three and to mean the drug was discontinued must have been they were reasonably significant. Yeah, so interesting molecule, interesting new sort of class, I guess, new target. So this was an enriched population. So one of the questions I first thought of was, you know, how many patients actually do have this GFR2 beta overexpression or amplification? And I think the authors answered that in the abstract, didn't they? They did. So approximately 30% of the patients screened were eligible based on immunohistochemistry. 
as you might expect, it's a substantially smaller population that are FGFR2 amplified in this study by ctDNA. Approximately, I think, 10 to 15 percent of those patients were also amplified. Uh, and 5% of the population were only amplified and not overexpressed by immunohistochemistry, whereas 95% were overexpressed by immunohistochemistry, of which 10 to 15% were also amplified. Yeah. But anyway, it's great to see some work being done in this space. I mean, 30% is quite a substantial proportion, obviously. You know, we've seemed to have hit a bit of a brick wall in terms of progress with gastric cancer. I was talking to Nick Pavlakis about lung cancer and how it's become very rational and there's a lot of targets being, we're understanding a lot more about the targets and we have treatments against those targets, but often they're one or two percenters. So, so 30% is quite substantial. So let's hope that the toxicities can be ironed out and that we may see this molecule or others in this space move forward. Well, that's right. It's becoming quite an interesting area, HER2 negative gastroesophageal cancer, because not only have we got this molecule, we also have the Claudine target. I think you're aware of the anti-Claudine antibody that's showing promise in phase two studies and there are ongoing phase three studies. We now have immunotherapy with nivolumab from Checkmate 649, pembrolizumab plus limbatinib is being studied in phase three. So this could become a crowded space over the next few years, couldn't it? And who knows what the crossover is between between FGFR2 overexpressors versus PD-1, CPS overexpressors. But then I think the challenge might be molecular heterogeneity, both temporally and spatially, and do we need to re-biopsy on progression, or would it become a circulated tumour DNA assessment? All this complexity of the tumour is going to, we're going to somehow have to grapple with and become more agile with our treatments. Yeah, they're great points. And let's hope we don't make this sort of, we learn from other cancers and don't just reinvent the wheel in gastric cancer but so all those issues in some cancers have been thought about and you know in breast cancer we know it's important to re-biopsy the expression of biomarkers can change so I would say the answer to that point you made was yes we probably would need to it would be prudent to re-biopsy and have another look so it's going to be a fascinating time lots to do and so it's all going to be driven by trials so I think we're all going to need to be involved in lots of trials moving forward. Yeah, that's right. We should be opening the Pembrolizumab Limbatinib Phase 3 study. I think it's LEAP 015. We're opening that here at the Royal Brisbane very soon, so that's exciting for us. Fantastic. Was there anything else that caught your eye at the meeting, Matthew, in gastric cancer in particular? I think they were the main things. I, I heard that the FDA had approved Trastuzumab Derex Tecan for gastric cancer around the time of ASCO GI was on, so that was exciting news. And we've talked about that previously on the podcast. We'll put up the link to that study as well on the notes for this podcast and also the others that you mentioned earlier. So yeah, so it is an exciting time. A few new, a few new treatments, a few new targets in gastric cancer. Yes, both in HER2 negative and HER2 positive. Um, with pembrolizumab being combined with trastuzumab in randomised phase three studies and trastuzumab derex tecan. So um, maybe finally we'll see some progress in HER2 positive disease, which, you, which we haven't seen for a decade since the publication of the TOGA study. Yeah. So thank you again, Matthew, for giving up your time and coming on the show. It's been great to have you, and we we'll look forward to having you on again as there's more progress in this space. My pleasure, and happy to come on any time. It's been great. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to welcome Christos Karapetis to this Oncology Journal Club ASCO GI special. Kelly Mounter, Chris, thanks for coming on and giving up your time. You possibly had the best abstract from the meeting or one of the best abstracts from the meeting. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's potentially a kind of a practice, well, it is, I think, a practice-changing abstract and it comes on the back of the presentation at ASCO, I think that many people would have at least heard about. So it's certainly a, a pleasure for me to kind of go over the results. And before I start, I want to say that this podcast, the Oncology Journal Club, is uh, one of my favourites. I feel very privileged and, and special to be talking on one of, one of my favourite podcasts. So, so uh, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. So let's get into it. This is Keynote 177. 
phase three randomized study of pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy for microsatellite instability high advanced colorectal cancer. Christos, do you want to just outline the, the study and the, the main findings for us? Thank you. We are involved in looking after GI cancer patients and particularly colorectal cancer feel that we've been left out of the the buzz around immune therapy with the immune therapy treatments really not having much of a role to play, at least not up until this Keynote 177 study. Keynote 177 looked at a particular subgroup where it was thought that the immune therapy type of treatment would have an effect. It was actually a phase two study, Keynote 164, that showed a fairly high response rate of 33% in pre-treated colorectal cancer with a long duration of response. So those that respond, respond for a long time. So it appeared that there was a subgroup of patients who would benefit. And that was the background that set up Keynote 177. Keynote 177 was a study of first-line therapy for patients that had advanced colorectal cancer, where the cancer had this state of being considered microsatellite unstable or MSI high, microsatellite instability high. So for for those, I mean, we've all heard of the term, but really when we talk about MSI, we're really talking about a state or a condition where there is significant genetic hypermutability. There are lots of sort of DNA mutations. And it happens because the process of mismatch repair is deficient. So we consider these mismatch, mismatch repair deficient cancers. So the, the mismatch repair system, is people sometimes liken it to a spell checker. And normally it would come through and repair or delete all the, the misspellings. Well, it doesn't work in somebody that has this mismatch repair deficiency. And unfortunately, the cancer then develops and grows. And it has a lot of mutations. It's this hypermutated state. And it was thought that these cancers would be more susceptible to immune therapy. They've got a higher tumor mutational burden. You've probably heard that term before, the TMB. So I think with the phase two data suggesting that this would work, the phase three study was set up where half the patients received standard chemotherapy. We're talking the full foxes, the full theories, with or without an antibody. And the other half received the immune therapy drug pembrolizumab, given at a fixed dose of 200 milligrams every three weeks for up to two years. So it was a straight-out one-to-one randomization. It's important to know that those patients that were in the chemotherapy arm were allowed to cross over to receive immune therapy on progression. And so an important endpoint is progression-free survival. The progression-free survival was significantly prolonged in patients that received pembrolizumab. We knew that already from the presentation at ASCO where we did see a significant improvement in the time to progression. We saw an improvement in the response rate and an improvement in the duration of response. Now, uh, at ASCO GI, so that was at ASCO back, well, it would have been in Chicago. It wasn't. It was all online, but that was back in June. So what we saw or what we heard through ASCO GI, the Gastrointestinal Cancer Symposium, was an update of PFS, and this time looking specifically at the endpoint that's commonly referred to as PFS2. So it's the time to to the second progression. So they looked at what happened to patients after they had had their immune therapy and actually had progression, and they looked to see how long it took before they got the second progression-free survival event. I mean, it may be that it doesn't really matter when you give the immune therapy and maybe if you give the immune therapy after chemotherapy, you'll get the same benefit. So they wanted to see if that was true, if the PFS2, the second disease, the second time to progression was going to be significantly different between the two arms. We don't have overall survival data yet, so that still hasn't come through. The endpoints haven't been reached, there haven't been enough deaths, so we're waiting on that. So the crossover rate, ended up being about 59%. 56 uh, patients received crossover in accordance with the study design and 35 patients actually received crossover off trial. So it was 91 patients in the chemotherapy arm that crossed over in the end. The total number of patients on the study was 307. So we've got 
data that looks at this time to second progression. And what we found is that it was significantly better for the immune therapy arm. The 12-month progression-free survival was 76% with pembrolizumab versus 67%. The 24-month progression-free survival was 65% versus 50%. The hazard ratio was 0.63. So even at PFS2, we see an improvement with the immune therapy. The median time to progression, if we include PFS2, was 23.5 months. It wasn't it, with chemotherapy. It wasn't reached with the immune therapy. The other thing that's really interesting is if you look at the actual response rate, what you see is that there's a significantly higher response rate with chemotherapy. And, and, that's, and that includes complete responses. There are about 11% of patients in the immune therapy arm had a CR versus only 3% in the chemotherapy group. So there was a higher response rate. But if you look at stable disease, it's significantly higher with chemo. And so the progression rate, the rate of actual progression, if you look at the number of patients that had PD, it was actually higher with immune therapy. So there is a subgroup of patients, and we can't really work out exactly who they are yet. It may be RAS mutations who are not responding, and they're progressing usually sort of fairly early. So they actually come in as a, as a disease progression case. So uh, not everybody responds to immune therapy, but if you do get a response, the response is a long response. The duration of response is significantly longer with immune therapy than it is with chemotherapy. And the overall progression-free survival was significantly improved. And the other thing they presented was an update on some of the quality of life data. And what we see is that the quality of life data is overall significantly better with the immune therapy. When they look at various functional scales, um, it's better. When they look at fatigue and various symptom scales, it's better. So we've got a treatment that can work. It usually works fairly quickly. Where it works, it works for a long time. Um, we know what the side effects are with immune therapy, and, and I think most medical oncologists are now very familiar about managing side effects of immune therapy. We still don't have the overall survival data, but given the, the strength of the data, I, I think that we're really at a point now where if we could give immune therapy as a first-line treatment for patients with MSI high bowel cancer, I think we would. Uh, we still have the issue of access because it's not fun yet. Yeah, that's right. So you mentioned practice changing, but as yet in Australia, and so some of our listeners are working internationally, but some will have access to the drug. But in Australia, I think until we get the survival data, we're probably not going to certainly get government-funded access. Having said that, I know that, you know, d depending on the nature of the case, I know that oncologists are kind of doing all that they can to, to, to get immune therapy for patients in this sort of situation. It's a small subgroup of the metastatic colorectal cancer subset, and it may mean looking for compassionate access or asking for approval through state government funding mechanisms through public hospitals. Veterans Affairs would fund the treatment um, if the patient's a gold card holder. So that there may be ways, and obviously clinical trials, if there are clinical trials running, you could look at that. That's right. And so you mentioned at the start, you know, that about DNA repair mechanisms. So where to next? What's the next trial? I mean, PARP inhibitors would be a fairly obvious potential partner with these drugs because of, because of its ability to inhibit DNA repair mechanisms. Do you know of any work that's going on? Because that's probably a great, would be a great way if we can access a study that's PEMBRO versus PEMBRO plus something else. That's right. I think looking at molecular targeted therapies and combining them with immune therapy is certainly an attractive approach, and it may be PARP, it may be other uh, molecular targets. This is certainly proving to be effective in other cancer types. We're seeing trials in hepatocellular carcinoma, for instance, in the GI space where we're seeing combined immune therapy plus VEGF targeting or or multi-targeted TKIs uh, proving to be effective. We're certainly seeing the same in the renal cell carcinoma space. So there may well be a benefit in combining molecular targeted therapy with immune therapy. I think the next studies are probably going to look at combining chemotherapy with immune therapy. Keynote 177, it was a 
chemo or immune therapy study, but I think it's an open question as to whether or not patients may have a better response if they actually have the chemo and the immune therapy combined. And we know that, for instance, in, in lung cancer, we've seen the combined data prove to be more effective. But in other cancers like bladder, we haven't seen that. So I think it's, uh, it's important to do the right clinical trials. And I understand there are chemo immunotherapy trials ongoing. And I know there are some studies looking at combining immune therapy with PARP inhibition and other molecular targeted therapies. Fantastic. So was there anything, thanks so much, Christos, was there anything else that caught your eye at the meeting? One of the research interests that we have at uh, Flinders is interest around the microbiome. And we're starting to see some work that's looking at assessing the microbiome as a, as a biomarker, a predictor of, uh, of treatment efficacy. And there was an interesting study that looked at the microbiome in patients receiving nivolumab uh, immune therapy with GI cancer. And there was an indication from that, and the, the data is still preliminary really, but that a microbiome diversity is a predictor for benefit from immune therapy. So there may be a way to kind of modulate the microbiome to make your patients have a better chance of benefiting from immune therapy. But obviously we need more research. Yeah, it's a really interesting field. So we'll put a link to that abstract as well. So again, Christos, thank you so much for giving up your time coming on the podcast. Hopefully first of many appearances going forward as new information comes out and no doubt, you know, you'll be an author on some key papers in the future and we look forward to having you back on again. Thank you so much. Yeah, look, thanks again for inviting me to speak on one of my favourite podcasts. I can't wait till I'm on my bike and listening to the podcast and hearing my voice and I'll probably crash. But, yeah, okay, thanks. Well done, thanks so much. See you later. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Tim, welcome to Oncology Journal Club podcast. I think you're a virgin. I am. I am indeed. I haven't been on before, so thank you for the invitation. It's fantastic. Tim, you're well known to an, our international audience. Uh, Hans actually has four listeners, his family in Belgium, so that's his contribution to our audience. But uh, you're well known there and around the world for your role as a GI oncologist and clinical trialist and, of course, your wonderful leadership of our Australian Gastrointestinal Trials group AGITG for many years. It's always hard to get that through with an AGITG. It's amazing how many people get that wrong, but yeah. (laughs) Fantastic. So did you enjoy ASCO GI this year? And cutting edge is obviously neoadjuvant therapy for rectal cancer. It is, I think, a, a paradigm shift, slowly, not yet successfully, I think, convincing our surgeons to switch to a significant amount of chemotherapy before surgery. But tell us about the NRG G1002 trial where ARM2 was presented. Yeah, so I I guess I'd just comment on your point around trying to get the surgeons to, to switch. I mean, I think from the main ASCO meeting, we had quite a lot of really interesting data around changing from post operative to to preoperative TNT therapy, and I think it's been an interesting discussion. I think in Adelaide, uh, we've been able to convince the surgeons. Maybe we've got a bit more convincing uh, power, so to speak. So, yeah, the NAG study was was really interesting. So it builds on, I guess, the US trend that's been around for a long time. I've, I've heard Tom George, who is the uh, senior author on this, talk about the shift to TNT in the US for a long time at the NCI meetings and this sort of platform study he's presented many a time interestingly at the NCI sort of task force around how it works and uh, this was the pembrolizumab platform looking at the TNT approach so Folfox as you'd expect and then the long course chemoradiotherapy combined with pembrolizumab and I guess hoping that that uh, sort of abscopal or the radiation sort of induced change in the immune environment might lead to the additional benefit of pembrolizumab. Um, so it was a very interesting design, yeah. And we're joined now by the wonderful Hans Prennan. Uh, he doesn't come in for just anyone, Tim. Hans, how are you going in Belgium with this shift to TNT in terms of your surgeons engaging? So you mean specifically in, in rectal cancer, you mean? 
well, colon's even further behind, but yeah. we can talk about that. <laughs> yeah, indeed. So rectal cancer, we had we had a debate about this. I'm a big fan personally, but I still see some doubts with uh, some specialists who have difficulties of changing their approach because it's a completely different approach. But I'm always a fan of uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy in general in tumors. Eh? So because you can see whether they're responding you select out the good ones. There are many advantages of this approach. So I'm personally a big fan. So one of the issues that we have are with some of the neoadjuvant chemo radiation protocols that have short course radiation. But Tim, this study had long course and actually six doses of Pembro starting on the day of the chemo RT. Although interestingly, Only 46% of patients received all six doses of the Pembro. What do you make of that? I mean, I think that was interesting. I mean, yeah, but it is based on that sort of platform of of the the Folfox, sort of the US uh, schema of four months, and then the long course chemotherapy. So it isn't isn't short course, as you say. It it didn't really go into the details of why there was a drop off, but it was interesting that they didn't end up completing the uh, full course of Pembrolizumab, as, as, as you touched on. But at the end of the day, I mean, I, I guess the idea here is really a relatively short dose to change the immune environment and use the the impact on uh, then the addition of pembrolizumab. I think the the results were were interesting. So the, the other key thing here is to remember that they were all comers, so there was no selection. I mean, we've seen some interesting data, very small numbers with nivolumab in the neoadjuvant setting in the, M- the, the, the deficient mismatch repair group, but this was all comers, and we haven't seen be nice to see whether there were patients in there with deficient mismatch repair and what 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 they did in terms of response. But really, the the outcomes were, I guess, somewhat disappointing. Really, in that there was no significant improvement in complete response, pathological complete response. The other thing that I thought was quite interesting was actually the difference between, not that it relates to the the endpoint, but the difference between the clinical complete response and then the pathological complete response because we're basing a lot of our watch and wait on the outcome for clinical complete response. But here there was quite a disconnect, you know, around 14, 15%. So whether the scans and things were too early for that, I guess, but it's about a 14% clinical complete response, but the pathological complete response was the 30% that we've seen in some of those other studies. So it does lead to a little bit of a question about how we assess clinical response. We're not, and in this case, we may be missing patients who could be watched, for example. I thought that was quite interesting. And the NAR score, their method of assessing the pathological response, are you using that any sort of robust scoring here? No. So I think the discussant, I think, was interesting when he discussed the study and he actually made the point that whenever this NAR score, which is very peculiar to this sort of group of investigators, is raised, he always has to have it explained. So it's it's sort of a a mean, it's a mathematical model based around various factors. At the end of the day, I think what's more relevant to us is understanding the pathological complete response rate. That's what we can sort of understand. And and I guess you see the, you know, the percentages there were very similar, you know, very small increase in the Pembro group. But look, that could be driven, of course, by a small subgroup of patients with mismatch repair. I mean, that's, that, I think that'll be really interesting to see that data down the track. But it, it doesn't really talk to this being a, a new standard, yeah. And we saw patients with both stage two and three, and also ECOG two was allowed. Uh, many mm. a trial, as we know in AGITG, has been sunk by the ECOG two group. We do want lots of inclusivity, but in a small phase two, and compared to some of the previous neoadjuvant, which picked the very, very highest risk for the TNT, do you think that may have been an issue to broad an inclusion criteria? Well, I think, I mean, exactly having, you know, the spectrum from stage two to stage three does create sort of confusion. I think the other studies, as you know, were very, very targeted in their their selection. And particularly in a small subgroup, including ECOG2, I mean, you have to wonder why these patients were ECOG2, you know, what else was going on in the setting of theoretically potentially operable disease down the end of the track. So it was an interesting inclusion. And I think exactly, I think sometimes you can be too broad. I think our policy is probably, you know, AGITG policy is probably a good one. 
And for our listeners, be specific about inclusion. Is that is that what you're referring to? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think yeah, exactly. Or, yeah. or the policy of you going out getting drunk at ASCO GI <laughs> that you weren't able to do. Well, that's right. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, I do miss those evenings. But no, 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 to your point, being specific is the key. So, you know, having a very tight inclusion criteria, particularly when you've got a small group and you're trying to look at uh, uh, differences in this sort of platform study. I mean, at the end of the day, you're trying to look for signal and then to move on to, to larger studies. So I think, you know, whether they've learned from that or whether as a group we can feed it back, perhaps if we ever meet again, we might have the opportunity to, to have that discussion with them face to face. And get drunk at the same time. And, and, well, maybe not in the morning. Their, their meetings are often <laughs> about seven o'clock in the morning, but may, well, I suppose you could carry on over from the night before, but yeah, yeah, that's right. It's been known to happen. Thank you so much, Tim. Appreciate your expertise, particularly on all things rectal and for analysing that uh, for us. And just by having you on the podcast with your vast Twitter audience and appeal I think our uh, numbers will go through the roof. Thank you very much again. That's been a pleasure. Good to see you again. So, Eva, now that I presented my quick bites and you told me I couldn't present data on cholangiocarcinoma, so what do you have news about cholangiocarcinoma? Well, Hans, it's really become a poster child for personalised therapy. As you know, about 30% of cholangios, intrahepatic cholangios, have actionable mutations. And actually some of them will turn an A cup into a defined disease if you get an FGFR alteration. So a fusion, which is 80% or rearrangement, in which accounts for about 20% of the FGFR alterations and said to be in about 15% of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas. Interestingly, much higher if you do a liquid biopsy than a tumor biopsy. So we've already got the oral TKI pemigatinib approved by the FDA. This was infragratinib, a phase two trial looking at progression after previous treatment, obviously with the FGFR fusion biomarker. They reported cohort one of 120 patients looking at toxicity and safety and responses. And the overall response rate was 23%, 95 CI 15 to 32, median duration of response five months. So it's not clear what advantage this second in class has over the original, but more data supporting this targeted approach And the second was the final results of the phase three clarity study. Again, IDH1 mutations found, said to be found in about 20% of intrahepatic cholangios. This was ivacitinib versus placebo. This drug inhibits the mutant protein. 10.3 10.3 versus 7.5 months, hazard ratio of 0.79. The primary 95% confidence interval crossed one, but there was crossover allowed and taken up in about 70% of patients. So using the rank-preserving structural failure model, which accounts for crossover, the hazard ratio was statistically significant. So this has now been incorporated into the NCCN guidelines and the practice points really are that you must do biomarker testing on all your cholangios and if you don't have these agents, refer for clinical trials. There are plenty around. Maybe two small questions, Eva. So one on the infigratinib, uh, maybe you noticed, but it seems that there are better responses in earlier lines. And this is something we see also with other targeted agents. Is it something you agree on? Absolutely. There is cohort two, which covers FGFR one and three, whereas cohort one is FGFR two only. And there's also a third cohort that is looking at people who have previously got anti-FGFR therapy. And there is a phase one trial of first using this agent first line versus chemo that is underway. So earlier use, although this is not thought to be a prognostic biomarker, 
only a predictive biomarker, but earlier use is like most things likely to be more successful. And patients with cholangio deteriorate quickly, as you know, have liver function abnormality and are often quite sick. And maybe another question that some listeners might have, do you have actually access? Because in Belgium, for example, we have a problem with evocidinib and it's yeah, unaffordable if you have to pay it yourself. So we don't have access to the drug. We have no off-trial access, but fortunately there's quite a lot of trial activity One of the problems is getting tissue. Most of the trials mandate tissue. Interestingly, on the Twitter sphere, people are now treating on the basis of liquid biopsy and, you know, a clinical diagnosis of cholangio with that added confirmation of a positive liquid biopsy. So that's a sort of new paradigm as well. Yeah, fully agree. So Hans, did you enjoy ASCO GI this year? Actually, I was in the uh, poster highlight session where I could, or where my abstract was presented and I was debating with uh, some other people. Unfortunately, the English was not always perfect, but that's an issue that we sometimes see at ASCO GI. But I'm quite glad that I could follow it online and select the some papers which I would like to present today. Okay. And sometimes we have English problems on this podcast too. (laughs) That's completely right. (laughs) So go for it. Hans's ASCO GI quick bites. There were three abstracts from the LEAP005 trial, which is, as you might know, a phase two multi-cohort study of a combination of lenvatinib plus pembrolizumab, the famous combination of an anti-androgenic agent together with immune therapy. And they presented actually three abstracts, three different ones from different subgroups. So one was from the gastric cohort, one from the colon, and one from the biliary tract cohort. Actually, I can summarize very briefly. In the gastric, we saw in 32 patients a response rate of 10%. In the colon, importantly, there were MSS patients. They had 32 patients included with a response rate of 22%. And in the biliary tract, 31 patients with a response rate of 10%. So in general, you can think it's quite low, but on the other hand, these are all quite chemorefractory patients. And I think it's it's a very promising combination if we know in which patients it will work or it won't work. A second one is also a combination of anti-androgenesis with anti-PD-1. It's a phase two trial, a Chinese trial with camerelizumab and apatinib in second line oesophageal squamous cell carcinoma. The trial is still ongoing, so they only report the results of 46 patients with a response rate of 43%, nine month survival of 61%. So again, very promising activity, but it's a very early results of the trial. We have also the study with atezobef in HCC, but that's the one that you also know. They just presented updated overall survival data, but no new messages there. And finally, and most importantly, there was also a result of a phase one trial with CAR T cells in colon carcinoma. We don't want to hear this one. Yeah, but it's presented by a Belgian one, by a Belgian famous researcher called Hans Prenen. We don't have enough Belgian listeners, so I'm cutting this out. Still, you have to give me a chance to give to tell something about it. So it's a, it's a result of a CAR T cells in chemorefractory colon cancers, and actually we present the data of 15 patients, so not a lot, and it's a highly it's a selected group that were able to receive CAR Ts against the NKG2D receptor, and it's actually a receptor which is there on cancerous cells and less on normal cells. And I can just say that the data are promising, but again, it's a highly selected population. We see some responses, but the trial is still ongoing and we hope to combine it even in the future with uh, immune therapy. Actually, that is the most interesting one, Hans. What was the tox like? Actually, the toxicity was was quite good because, as you might know, it's an allogenic CAR-T and uh, also designed to avoid graft versus host disease, what we often see with other CAR-Ts. And in this study, the tolerance was extremely good. We didn't have one patient with graft versus host. We had one patient with a slight fever, but for the rest, it was very well tolerated. 
So, Hans, you can become a resource person for all of us for CAR T and solid because there's solid tumors. There's not that many in the world. So nope. you heard it here first. Uh, yep. Jump on Twitter and contact Hans Prennan after you've listened to all the podcasts. Thanks, Hans. Great quick bites. You're welcome. You've been listening to the Oncology Podcast. If you enjoyed today's edition and would like to subscribe, head over to our website, oncologynews.com.au, and sign up to our newsletter. Thanks for listening.